really, really happy to have everyone here again. I think we have a really good uh, turnout. Yep, looking at the screen, we've got another uh, full house, so to speak. Um, we have a, a, a colleague and a friend of our association, uh, Dr. Ravain, with us tonight, who's going to talk about something near and dear to all of our hearts, the Gnostics, version one, two, and three. Um, Dr. Urbane, who is a dear friend, I don't think there's anybody I've met who has as much passion for the uh, subject matter of nuclear medicine. He's been uh, in the field for, for quite a while. I won't say how many years at this point, but it's quite a while. Um, he comes uh, from uh, Belgium, uh, where he studied medicine at the University of Louvain and then did his uh, internal medicine and nuclear medicine training uh, there as well in Brussels. He subsequently also obtained a PhD in genetics and molecular biology at Temple University in Philadelphia. I think that was at a time before we realized exactly how much uh, the field of nuclear medicine would move towards uh, where his PhD was um, at the time, so a visionary in many ways. Uh, he's been a professor of imaging uh, medicine and biology for uh, almost three decades at various uh, um, universities and areas in North America, including uh, London here in, in Canada, where he still maintains a very uh, a very strong presence. And I know he's got a it's very near and dear to his heart. And we're very fortunate to have have him as as one of our board members and also uh, uh, luminaries in terms of, uh, of presenting uh, cutting edge um, technologies. He currently is working at the uh, Roseville uh, Park Center in, in Buffalo, but he has done stints as well as at University of Western Ontario. He's also been at Temple at the Chase Cancer Center and in the Cleveland Clinic and the VA administration and more recently at Wake Forest in, in um, North Carolina. He was a long-term uh, president uh, of the Canadian Association of Nuclear Medicine. He's gone on to be the president of the World Federation of Nuclear Medicine Biology and currently has been nominated to the SNMMI for the position of vice president-elect. His current interests are many, but particularly precision medicine and theranostics, and that's what he's going to talk to us about. And with that, I'm going to give you the floor, Dr. Urbane, and look forward to another very enriching conversation. And just before I go off, please, if you have any questions, enter them in your question box, and we will get to those at the end of Dr. Urbane's lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... And who and, and thank you for um, telling everybody that I just celebrated my 34th birthday uh, for the second time. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. There might be people from overseas. I don't know. Uh, some people might watch uh, the video later. So uh, a, a friend of mine uh, with whom I work at uh, in London, Ontario, basically, I didn't say good morning, good evening. You just uh, was saying a uh, good day. Uh, <clears throat> I have to admit that, uh, yes, I'm passionate about uh, the therapy, probably because my background is in uh, internal medicine and nuclear medicine. Uh, so for the longest period of time, we were largely limited uh, in terms of what we had uh, to treat patients in nuclear medicine. It's not the case uh, any longer. And there, to my opinion, there has uh, never been a better time uh, to practice uh, uh, nuclear medicine. Uh, the field of diagnostic is just uh, exploding. What I'd like to do with you tonight, and it might take a little bit more than an hour, we'll try not to expand too much, but uh, is to give you some historical perspective, uh, see, to explain where we're coming from. Uh, and then make some comment about establishing a theranostic program. And it's not that easy. I had a headhunter company uh, this morning on the phone, uh, and a uh, headhunter are looking for heads, uh, but they have no idea what's inside the head. So uh, the bottom line is that it's not that easy, as uh, we might eventually discuss later. Uh, the current clinical aspect and challenges, uh, we'll talk about this. The clinical research opportunities, which are uh, many, and then I will talk about the educational challenge and opportunities. In a week from now, I will be flying to the to Vienna to the International Atomic Energy Agency on behalf of the United States uh, and Canada to talk about 
are those educational challenges, not only for physicians, but also for technologists, uh, uh, for uh, nurse practitioner, for uh, physician uh, extender, assistant, uh, and so on. Uh, can I get the, the next slide, please? So for those of you who are diagnostic, you probably know uh, the word uh, and you have heard it. If you haven't heard it, I definitely encourage you to do some simple reading uh, with uh, Nikolai and, and Francois and some others. We have uh, uh, a magazine called The e Patient. We publish many articles on that. But the word diagnostic, as you know, is the contraction of therapy and diagnostic. That word was actually coined in 1998, um, uh, actually, by a gentleman called uh, John Frank Hoser. Uh, John Frank Hoser was actually uh, a freelancer writing an article. And then, uh, because of uh, that work and his uh, passion for diagnostic and therapeutic uh, uh, compound, became the CEO of Pharmanetics. And in, in his mind, he wanted to design uh, what he called a two-stage uh, two drug package with, where he would have a diagnostic test. Uh, and not to distract you, I'm going to basically get rid of my uh, uh, webcam here. But uh, So he wanted basically to design a system where there would be a diagnostic test. It could be, at the time, it was not uh, imaging. It was like a biomarker, like CEA or PSA, and a targeted drug therapy uh, based on the, the result of the diagnostic test. Ultimately, uh, basically wanted the company to be uh, very successful. Next slide, please. But if you really think about it, uh, Theranostic uh, is intuitively for us not new. Uh, that's the basic uh, and the keystone, has been a keystone of the nuclear medicine uh, professions are our field, uh, and, and the reason is because uh, uh, we uh, have used uh, radio iodine for uh, we have used radio iodine for a long time uh, to make the diagnosis and treatment. And I used to joke with my patients, saying uh, when I treat them for thyroid cancer, I, I used to tell them. Uh, look, uh, we know quite a bit uh, about this disease. We have been do doing this since the 1940s. And they look at me and I said, well, be reassured. I wasn't there at the time. Uh, but clearly, we have a great knowledge uh, about uh, uh, radio iodine and the use of the same molecule, uh, the same compound uh, for diagnosis and, and treatment. What you probably do not know is actually, if you think about uh, the true word theranostic, uh, it came about uh, in the uh, in the 40s, uh, and uh, the real pioneer was a gentleman, uh, which is pictured on this uh, uh, on this slide. Is Albert Keston. What Albert Keston did in a patient who had a thyroidectomy before, uh, he basically gave a capsule of iodine and follow. At the time, we didn't have gamma camera, so basically use a Geiger counter. And what he discovered in that patient is that the patient had uh, a significant signal at the level of the femur, uh, and then he treated the patient. So uh, Albert Keston can be credited for discovering basically uh, a radio iodine avid metastasis in, in the femur. Before Albert Keston, uh, the patient was treated with radio iodine, but most of the iodine uh, we're going to the thyroids and surgery was not uh, necessarily in, in current in, in uh, wide practice uh, then. And then they discovered that in order for metastases to take iodine, they had to remove the thyroid. Um, Neuronocline tumor. Uh, the, the picture at the top left or the sign on the top left is the one of a zebra. Very difficult to make the diagnosis of neuronocline tumor. Neuronocline tumor are actually uh, refer to um, solid tumor, and Nicola, I'm assuming that you're on that uh, on that slide at this point in time. So, neuronocline tumor refer to solid tumor that originate from specific cell, which share a common phenotype, which is characterized by the expression of multiple genes, which include both endocrine and neuronal feature. And these neuroendocrine, or also called neurosecretory cells, receive neuronal input, 
via neurotransmitter from neuronal cells and in turn release their message. Uh, that's why you can basically find uh, neuroendocrine tumor, next slide, in every part of the body. This is a slide that I put together um, almost 10 years ago showing basically the different type of uh, uh, radio pharmaceutical that we can use uh, for uh, the diagnosis and uh, the treatment uh, of uh, neuroendocrine tumor. And as you know, uh, the most commonly used these days are the relative of uh, the, somatostatin, the somatostatin hormone, and uh, which bind uh, to the somatostatin receptor. The most successful over the past few years has been the dotatate compound, but there are a few others like dotanokids and, and so on. Uh, the advantage of dotatate is this exquisite uh, sensitivity specificity uh, for uh, somatostatin uh, receptor. The hormone somatostatin is shown here on the left side of the slides. It's either a 14 or 28 amino acid um, uh, hormone or peptide, uh, depending on the splicing in the different cells. Uh, what uh, is remarkable, and that's where basically most of the development in new radio pharmaceutical have happened, is uh, if you see that and you see that uh, in the orange color. Uh, is uh, the cyclic uh, ring of the human uh, somatostatin hormone uh, at the end, uh, made of uh, tryptophan, phenylalanine, lysine, and threonine. And if you look at the, the compound that we use for many years of triotide, uh, as a pretty much the same structure, uh, the uh, industry got rid of the tail uh, of the human somatostatin. One of the issues uh, that people do not necessarily talk about is that actually uh, when you label uh, a, re a pharmaceutical with a radioisotope, you have a very bulky molecule uh, to that compound. And uh, the bulky molecule can affect significantly the binding affinity for the receptor. That's why it's uh, quite difficult uh, to develop those compounds, and it takes time. This is one of the uh, early images. That's a distribution toward the body uh, in the anterior and posterior view of uh, with indium uh, one level of triotide, which we use when I was in London, both for diagnosis but also for treatment using the OG electron emission of uh, indium uh, one level. What is uh, nuclear diagnostic version 1.0? Well, those of you uh, who have been using your of Toyotide and Nolutatera, and eventually uh, a PSMA Provicto know that uh, basically uh, the, the principle is very simple. You identify an overexpressed receptor on the surface of the cells. Uh, you uh, take images uh, to detect those uh, receptors, and then you shoot at those receptors by uh, modifying uh, the isotope from a diagnostic isotope uh, to a killer isotope. Now, it's easy said, not necessarily easy done. For example, uh, Plovi the, the compound Plovicto is different uh, than the Gallium 68 compound. And there are a bazillion of PSMA compounds which, um, which have been developed, uh, maybe a, a, few, a few thousand. And uh, now the industry uh, and biotech company and venture capital uh, uh, people are investing in biotech company to develop, to develop the new blockbuster. I think Provicto is quite good, uh, moving into a different type of uh, killer isotope, uh, like the alpha emitter, probably going to be uh, more successful, but there are some side effects that we can eventually discuss. So the whole principle uh, uh, of uh, nuclear diagnostic version one is summarized on this uh, slide where uh, at the bottom left, you see the diagnostic uh, uh, procedure, uh, and on the right, basically, you label your compound uh, with a killer isotope and a, you treat patient. Easy set, uh, not necessarily um, easy done. Uh, a concept which is very important too is what's called isotope pair. And isotope pair refer to uh, the labeling of the pharmaceutical uh, peptide or hormone or molecule, small molecule, uh, labeled with uh, a diagnostic isotope, 
uh, and label uh, for uh, the, the treatment for the chemotherapeutic effect uh, with a, a therapeutic uh, uh, isotope. I've listed here uh, a few of them, uh, like uh, a, a few of them, like uh, yttrium, uh, like iodine 131, very well known, samarium. We don't really uh, use it uh, that much uh, uh, any longer. Radium 223, uh, when we didn't have uh, a PSMA, we use uh, that quite a bit. Uh, not necessarily a therapeutic effect, Bayer might disagree with me, but the fact of the matter, it, it was more than a painkiller um, than a, a real chemotherapeutic uh, uh, agent. Actinium, an alpha emitter, rotorium, uh, used essentially in the United States. I don't know if Triums uh, might be uh, might have embarked into that, uh, but it's not uh, for prime clinical use uh, uh, yet. So isotope pair uh, are, are an important factor. Uh, the, the radio pharmaceutical industry look very uh, carefully at that and, and try uh, basically uh, to develop a new compound uh, for us. And the next slide, please. Uh, the next slide uh, lists uh, right now those uh, theranostic, uh, nuclear theranostic pair, which are approved, at least by the FDA. As you know, um, Air Canada uh, is uh, probably even more stringent than the FDA. And, and clearly, in North America, we are 10 years behind uh, Australia uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, not necessarily the UK, but definitely mainland uh, Europe, we have had access. Uh, to these compounds for more than uh, more than 10 years uh, now. And uh, theranostic pair currently being eva evaluated. This is a, a, a snippet of uh, all the research uh, going on. Uh, the one that you might have heard the most is called FAPI, and uh, it used in pancreatic uh, cancer uh, model, but uh, my friend from um, the Switzerland, John Fryer, and as you know, uh, Sandoz uh, and Novartis, uh, I should say Novartis uh, is based in, in Switzerland, uh, tried to work in a very uh, close manner since uh, uh, John Fryer lived in Switzerland and uh, has been a champion also of Theranostic and immunotheranostic, we'll mention that uh, later on. But John Fryer was telling me that they have started to use actual Lutatera in some uh, soft tissue tumor. So there, is, there are clinical trials um, uh, going on. So it's a burgeoning field, it's an exploding field. Uh, the reality it takes about 10 to 15 years for a clinical trial compound, at least from phase one, uh, to achieve phase four. And when you achieve phase four, it's actually um, when uh, the compound is approved by the FDA of Health Canada, and that's when uh, you discover uh, basically uh, the side effect. Establishing a diagnostic program, I cannot tell you oh, that it's easy. It's quite problematic, it's quite difficult probably easier in Canada than in the United States. And the reason it's quite difficult in the United States compared to Europe and uh, compared to Australia is because most of the nuclear medicine department <clears throat> are, are actually part of radiology. And radiology by, uh, and radiology is by definitions, uh, they love images, IR might be a, uh, an exception, and still they love images, but they do treatment. Uh, but uh, radiologists have uh, a fundamental uh, difficulty to understand uh, what uh, uh, the treatment and the clinical environment needs um, needs to be, and that's what uh, the, the difficulty resides. There is no doubt uh, that uh, nuclear diagnostic, and by the way, nuclear diagnostic probably only ten percent of the field of diagnostic. You haven't heard, or you, maybe uh, very few of you have heard of uh, magnetic diagnostic, but that's coming. So, but nuclear diagnostic right now, that's what we have, that's what we can um, use to treat our patient. It's a very disruptive uh, chemo uh, therapeutic uh, agent, and everybody's struggling. Uh, I get inundated by phone call, people saying, Can you help us out? Uh, so uh, with uh, uh, Nicolas, Andrew, Francois, and other members of the board, we're trying basically uh, to help out as many people, as many centers as we can uh, to embark into uh, basically this renaissance and this explosion 
of um, a new therapeutic agent. Uh, my say usually is uh, uh, no money, no medicine, no medicine, no money. And uh, the, a most recent uh, market research analysis uh, would tell you uh, that uh, the field of nuclear medicine since 2000, in 2001 was growing by more than 10 percent, uh, which is remarkable and even higher than the inflation rate. Uh, so it tells you that basically uh, those companies, both like Novartis, uh, Pfizer, and, and, and the venture capital people are uh, engulfing money into that because they, they, they know or they project that by 2031, uh, the entire business is going to be worth at about $35 billion. And of course, they want to share of it. And by the way, uh, if you look at uh, the, uh, the difference in color, uh, the uh, yellow color and, and the dark blue color or the teal color, what it shows is that in, 20, uh, in 2021, probably 15, 20% of what we do, at most 20% uh, in blue, uh, was uh, a therapy by 2031, it's predicted that 67% of what we do is going to be therapy pretty much like the interventional radiology people. So I don't know about uh, what's going to happen in Canada. Uh, I love uh, the concept and the visions of uh, my dear friend Francois Lamoureux that every center in, in, in Quebec and in the United States it should have, I, I'm sorry, in Canada should have uh, uh, a, pet, a pet center. I think that most centers in uh, Canada uh, should not only have a pet, a pet uh, unit, but also should embark into therapy. And the reason is because it's not that complicated. Yes, Lutathera might be time consuming, uh, but if you compare the incidence of uh, neuroendocrine tumor cancer, prostate cancer, uh, it's uh, the magnitude is exponential. Uh, so I would encourage uh, all and each of you uh, to at least take a look at the possibility of starting treating patients with cancer, uh, with prostate cancer. One out of seven men uh, will have uh, a prostate cancer. This is an article published by uh, uh, Chernin and Jeremy Kalle from UCLA, as you know, Chernin, uh, is the um, editor of the Journal of Nuclear Medicine. And they look basically at the number of patients per year needed to be treated in a very conservative way and, and to some extent in a more realistic way. And uh, they came up with a, a number that in the United States, basically, uh, they, we would need about 300 um, therapy center uh, over the next uh, a few years, and a few years mean probably earlier than uh, than later, uh, in a realistic way, and I think it's uh, very realistic. And um, I used to tell people, wait until you get uh, a breast cancer, uh, not only imaging, but therapeutic agent, and you can probably multiply this uh, uh, by a factor two. So I think in Canada, it's very important to have as many center uh, as possible. Uh, I know the academic people uh, might basically argue that it has to be done, the quality has to be there. That's true. Uh, but the associations and uh, we have, uh, uh, we as the association and, and we uh, were, have been investing time and energy into that field, uh, need to pave the way uh, for uh, an easy access to patients all across, across Canada. Uh, the current clinical aspect and challenge. Um, current clinical aspect, those of you involved into <clears throat> uh, those uh, treatment are very familiar, and I apologize. I might probably look uh, quite redundant uh, for, you, for you guys, but for those of you who haven't really embarked, uh, uh, what I'm showing here uh, is basically uh, the, the Gallium 68 dotted date normal uh, distributions. Uh, the pattern of distribution of each of these compounds is very important uh, to basically make the diagnosis of, of those uh, uh, of those tumor if uh, they are present and if they express, uh, I should say, the overexpress uh, the uh, receptor. Uh, what you see on the left side of the slide is actually the diagnostic compound gallium 68, and now. 
we are using, uh, I don't know about uh, the centers in Canada, but we're using Copper 64. The advantage of Copper 64 is 13 hours half life versus basically 68 minutes of gallium. It's more commonly and widely available and it's easier uh, to handle. And at the bottom is actually uh, the Copper 64 compound. As you can tell, the compound might be slightly different. What's important is the affinity of the compound to the receptor, and then you enter uh, into a discussion between uh, those radio pharmaceutical company, and they always uh, pretend that they have the best compound. At the end of the day, uh, the patient diagnostic outcome and treatment outcome is what's the most uh, important. Impact is very significant when gallium 68 dilatate came and was uh, widely available in Europe. Uh, they demonstrate uh, that uh, uh, for the mid-gut uh, net uh, cancer, uh, basically uh, they would uh, have a very high uh, rate of uh, sensitivity, but also that they would change tremendously uh, the patient management. As you know, for neuronal tumor, there's not many compounds available. And tissue is basically uh, the before and the after, where the bone scan of these patients uh, with neuroendocrine tumor on the left show very few uh, bone metastases, and then you do uh, a dotated study. This is 70, 72 years old patients. Uh, the net was diagnosed in 2006, uh, and 2006 uh, is the, even, it's in Europe, is the, the arteriotype era. Uh, and the chromogranin was very elevated. Chromogranin, as you know, as a biomarker for neuronal tumor, 6,000 is a very high uh, number, and it's reflected uh, on the images. Uh, the next slide uh, by Danielle uh, Lindholm, uh, in uh, basically uh, published in a journal a few years ago, so basically the structure uh, of the lutetium dotatate octreotate. Uh, what, as I mentioned, basically, uh, instead of binding uh, the cyclic, instead of labeling the cyclic ring on the right side of the slide uh, with a diagnostic uh, isotope, uh, you had a blinker, uh, that's the square structure, and, and uh, it, uh, the linker is necessary in order uh, to label uh, the cyclic ring uh, of uh, the dotatate, uh, the, the uh, octreotate, so what is that in derivative uh, with uh, lutetium? So that's why uh, having a good radio chemist, uh, a good radio pharmacist uh, is also very important. And in today's world, difficult to afford that even in academic environment. Actually, the story of uh, Dota Tate, uh, of uh, Lutatera, started uh, in the late 90s, early 2000, with Eric Fredding uh, in, in Holland. And at one point in time, uh, the leading company uh, into this type of business was actually Malin Crod based in uh, St. Uh, Louis. Um, and they were working very closely with Eric Crenning and a few others. And they decided to create in, in the United States, that company doesn't exist any longer, a company called uh, Biosentima. And uh, Biosentima was created in 2001 in uh, uh, St. Uh, Louis. And it was actually a spin off of what's called the spirit uh, collaboration uh, between the industry and uh, academic centers, some in the United States, but mainly uh, in Europe. And in 2007, um, those of you remember the name, uh, know the name Covidian, basically Covidian acquired the right uh, of uh, lutetium 177.8 uh, from Bio uh, Cinema. So there's a, a, a rich history uh, behind the development of those compounds. And look, in 2001, uh, Biosentima uh, started to synthesize those compounds, do some trial in Europe, and we are 21 years later. And um, it was approved actually late in the United States in 2018. I think uh, it got uh, approved uh, a year or two later uh, by Health Canada. But it shows you uh, that. Uh, uh, how long it takes to develop such a compound. And the reason why radio pharmaceutical, uh, the radio pharmaceutical business was not that successful is because it's uh, uh, very costly to develop those compounds, to go to the huddle, uh, to the her, 
uh, to the hoofs and loops of uh, the regulator uh, for a profit which is not necessarily that great, at least it wasn't that great uh, for diagnosis, for therapy, it's a different story. The Netherwant pile, uh, which was conducted uh, in the United States, uh, uh, confirmed uh, what uh, the European knew for a long time, which is, yes, uh, mutation 177.8 enable some remission, uh, some uh, significant improvement in patient management. But if you look at the, the New England Journal of Medicine uh, article, actually, it was still a limited number of, um, of remission, about uh, uh, 18%. And in the group of, uh, I believe it was uh, 300 patients, uh, basically it was only one complete remission. Uh, so uh, successful, uh, only real true chemotherapeutic agent, nuclear chemotherapeutic agent, uh, but still, uh, the problem that we had in North America uh, is that usually uh, the oncologists or the um, gastroenterologists would send us to patients uh, when the disease was so extensive that it was uh, very difficult uh, to uh, see uh, any significant improvement uh, in, uh, in outcome. Uh, as, uh, as I said, in 2018, the FDA approved it. Health Canada, I think, was 2019, 2020. You'll find uh, this type of picture uh, for HIPAA uh, reason. I don't publish usually my own cases. Uh, but in Radiographic, which is a very good journal, if you look for a very good uh, nuclear medicine uh, article, uh, this case uh, shows uh, that over time after for treatment, uh, there is a significant uh, improvement in terms of uh, uh, the tumor burden of a neuroendocrine tumor patient treated uh, with, uh, uh, with Lutatera. On the left is the pre-treatment and on the post uh, is the post-treatment. Uh, uh, same uh, same thing here. Essentially, as you know, uh, mid gut uh, neuronocrine tumor uh, because of the portal system uh, usually metastasize uh, in the uh, uh, in the liver. If you have uh, a neuronocrine tumor at the level of the rectum, it can bypass the liver uh, because of uh, the venous return via the IVC, and you can find metastases. Uh, uh, in the lung, but most of the time you'll find those metastases in the liver. That can be treated uh, with uh, uh, C-sphere or terasphere or some type of, uh, uh, of taste, uh, but ultimately when the disease becomes systemic, uh, usually that's when uh, the, the referring physician sends the patient for systemic um, uh, therapy. Side effect. Uh, those of you who are not aware of it, <clears throat> there's a very good uh, uh, publication uh, by the National Cancer Institute uh, in the United States. It's called the Common Terminolo Terminology Criteria for Adverse uh, Events. Uh, I think they are finalizing the version uh, 7 uh, now. Uh, and you'll find in there uh, the all level of side effect uh, that enables you basically to adapt uh, you, um, uh, your dose uh, of uh, uh, nuclear uh, radiopharmaceutical uh, therapy, both uh, for Lutatera, uh, but also uh, for a PSMA. So I, I really recommend that uh, you look at this, uh, you um, uh, print that out. Uh, and you give that to your colleague or your nurse practitioner or physician assistant and, and technologist when you see this patient and have to decide uh, if you're going to treat or if you're going to basically continue the treatment or stop uh, the four treatment regimen for Lutatera or the six treatment regimen uh, for a PSME. I mentioned about uh, the mutation data data for mid-gut neuronocrine tumor. That's uh, the famous uh, NETR1 uh, trial. Uh, showing uh, that there was uh, a markedly longer progression-free survival. That's a key, progression-free survival, not necessarily complete uh, remission. Uh, in uh, a significantly higher response rate, uh, rate uh, to uh, Lutatera, uh, to Lutatera 177.8 than for, for the conventional 
core camp, I'll be daily or uh, monthly uh, daily uh, administration uh, to uh, to patient. And based on that, the FDA approved the camp. Uh, as I said, it was uh, uh, basically uh, 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 a reaction or a redemonstrating what the European and the Australian have known for uh, quite a long time. Uh, maintenance therapy. We have difficulty in the United States. I'm assuming it's going to be the same thing uh, in Canada. Uh, to continue past uh, the four treatment. If you have a very good response, uh, the insurance company in the United States, uh, and I'm assuming it's going to be true uh, with Health Canada too and with the uh, uh, different uh, provinces, uh, they do not allow us uh, to start a, a second cycle of four administration or to maintenance therapy. The European do maintenance therapy uh, every six months. Uh, or once a year, uh, depending on uh, patient's response and depending on the tumor. Nuclear diagnostic version 1.1. Uh, what people have realized is basically uh, that the Nether one trial uh, was a very focused uh, trial and, and basically uh, was addressing those neuronocrine tumor which were not that aggressive. So there are multiple um, initiatives uh, being take, uh, taken. It's called the Nether 2 trial, the Compose and Compete trial. Compete trial is basically uh, try um, and compete uh, Lutatera uh, with uh, a non-radioactive uh, uh, chemotherapeutic uh, agent. The reality, <clears throat> like for many cancer, is that uh, the best treatment is probably going to be a combination of uh, nuclear diagnostic and, and core compounds, a conventional chemotherapy. And the more we know about those abnormal signaling cascades uh, in cancer center, the better I will be able to treat those treatment. Uh, there is uh, still quite a debate, but I think the consensus is starting to, to emerge that if you're really serious about embarking into uh, nuclear diagnostic and treating your patient, you really need to do those symmetry. For the longest period of time, uh, the practice, and that was for commercial reason, and apparently for acceptance on the part of the provider, uh, I think it's essentially because it was easier for them and they would make, uh, uh, basically, uh, get a, a better return on their investment. Uh, they pretend that that one dose, uh, one size would fit all. That's not true. You really have to do good dosimetry, and it's challenging because uh, uh, software are complex. Uh, most centers do not have a physicist. So uh, please uh, consider this. Uh, get the help that you need, the SNMMI, at an initiative where basically you can subscribe and, and get some result. Not necessarily uh, always in a timely fashion, but dosimetry is a must-do uh, in order to evaluate the outcome of those uh, patients. Uh, I'm going to try to cover this quickly because I want to talk about selective diagnostic and immunotherapeutic. Uh, there's a fair amount of uh, patients, uh, a thyroid cancer patient, but that's true also for the other type of cancer, which basically at one point in time do not take up uh, radio iodine. It's called uh, radio iodine refractory thyroid cancer. And the reason is because uh, the more genetic uh, and genomic abnormality uh, occur during the lifespan of the tumor, uh, the least uh, expression of the sodium iodine uh, supporter uh, you see. And that's very important because those tumors become very aggressive. And even though the five-year survival of thyroid cancer, which is differentiated or localized, is about uh, 98, 99 percent, as soon as you have metastases and you see this in move uh, uh, on the, the graphic here, basically survival uh, is less than 50 percent. So very important, uh, basically, to take uh, early on those cancer treat early on. Uh, but uh, also to know if the cancer has spread out uh, or not. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is a, a, a very good uh, example. On the left side, you see a radio iodine total body scan, and um, uh, on image B uh, is actually an FDG study. And on the FDG study, you see two higher nodes uh, of uh, a patient with. Uh, uh, a different, an iodine refractory differentiate uh, uh, cancer. 
uh, in on the right side of the slide, C, F, E, and H, uh, you uh, also really see um, the uh, simultaneous uh, CT and the hybrid images uh, of the FDG study. This uh, uh, de differentiation of those cells and, and uh, the lack of expression of the sodium iodide transporter is known uh, by two names. One is called uh, the metabolic uh, switch, and, and the other one is the flip-flop mechanism. So early on, when thyroid cells are differentiated, basically sodium iodide supporter is expressed on the surface of the cells. Uh, over time, when the genome becomes very unstable, sodium iodide supporter is not expressed. The cells uh, become more aggressive, need more um, a fuel, the main fuel being the uh, glucose, uh, you can basically label uh, those very aggressive uh, thyroid cancer over time uh, with uh, FDG. And of course, the graphic on the right side shows the iodine accumulation in those uh, thyroid uh, cancer. Uh, and uh, over time, in the poorly differentiated thyroid cancer, you have no more iodine uh, uptake uh, shown uh, in uh, with the blue arrow going down over time, and you see FDG uptake uh, going up uh, also over time. This is a very important uh, concept, and it's true for most uh, tumor. Probably not necessarily as fast and not well known for the tumor because we don't have enough experience, uh, but uh, you'll see that it's going to become uh, true. This is um, a, a, a basically an algorithm that uh, which is largely published uh, and known. Uh, and if you think about it, in precision medicine, for the longest period of time, a patient with uh, no iodine take but an increased thyroglobulin, we were giving them 100, 150, 200 milligrams of uh, radio iodine. Uh, Sometimes the thyroglobulin would go down, but most of the time, uh, we would not necessarily see any result. And the reason is because of that flip-flop uh, mechanism, that uh, metabolic switch, and the de differentiation of those uh, thyroid cancer cells which become refractory to most everything. However, uh, in the pioneer uh, of this uh, has been a gentleman, I always, uh, Van Rostrom, uh, Van Rostrom uh, from Washington, has been basically to promote the redifferentiation uh, of those thyroid cancer cells. Uh, the best treatment for thyroid cancer still remain radio iodine uh, after surgery. So uh, what they do is basically they interfere with the signaling cascade. They block some uh, of the abnormal signaling cascade. And suddenly uh, you can, uh, and that's another uh, slide showing the complexity uh, of uh, those signaling cascade, but with the red arrow, uh, uh, on the signaling cascade, the green signaling cascade, uh, and the pink signaling cascade, uh, if you use the proper thyroid kinase, kinase inhibitor, you can suddenly re-differentiate those cells uh, to express those thyroid cancer cells uh, to express a sodium iodine supporter, and then you can retreat them uh, with iodine. This is uh, an example on the left, the baseline iodine 125 PET scan, iodine 124, uh, is a positron emitter. It's probably the best agent uh, to do thyroid cancer, not approved uh, by the Air Canada and by the FDA, uh, but the images are usually quite good. Uh, if you uh, treat those uh, refractor iodine thyroid uh, cancer patient uh, with thyroid kinase inhibitor, a targeted thyroid kinase inhibitor uh, on the specific uh, uh, signaling cascade, basically, you see again the expression of the sodium iodine supporter, and as soon as you see this, you can re-administer uh, iodine 131. And these are basically um, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six of the cases on the left side. That's the pre-thyrosine kinase inhibitor redifferentiation, and on the right side for each patient, it shows basically uptake. If you look at the second patient on the top, uh, uh, the top. Uh, at the middle of the slide, basically, you see uh, the uh, significant iodine uptake of the level of the lung. Uh, and as you know, uh, the, the miliary uh, spread out of thyroid cancer is very damaging, and uh, the mortality is quite high, and uh, the morbidity is quite high. 
So it's good to know uh, what you're dealing with in terms of tumor burden uh, and in terms of uh, prognosis. Prostate cancer. Uh, this is what I call, uh, what I've called uh, two, three years ago, uh, that uh, I predicted that we would face a prostate tsunami. We haven't really faced a prostate tsunami yet because uh, uh, like for Alzheimer's disease and the diagnostic uh, compound, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the two protein and the amyloid uh, marker of, uh, that we have uh, available uh, at least uh, for research for Alzheimer's disease, uh, the regulatory agency and the government are afraid uh, to become bankrupt uh, with the cost of these uh, uh, the cost of these uh, radiotherapeutic agents, uh, particularly with the level of incidence of uh, prostate uh, uh, prostate cancer, so it's uh, parallel uh, than with uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and uh, I would recommend for those of you interested to look at at least these two articles, uh, the Ternostic article uh, published. Uh, the Ternostic is a free journal published by the journal by uh, John Hopkins. Uh, the uh, uh, the, the, the web link is uh, thtno.org, uh, I believe. Uh, it's a free subscription and it gives a lot of information about Theranostic. Uh, another article published in the Journal of Nuclear Medicine uh, in 2022 uh, described the history uh, of prostate specific membrane antigen. And you'll discover that actually PSMA has been around since uh, 1987, or at least was known since 1987. And uh, if you uh, uh, do the maths, uh, it's more than a quarter of a century later that basically uh, it's uh, somewhat widely uh, available uh, to treat those uh, cancer uh, patients. Uh, the PSMA receptor, uh, not it's supposed to have multiple uh, functions. Uh, usually uh, when, uh, when publications show multiple function means that no a uh, very precise function has been uh, really identified. Uh, what's, what's important is that uh, they're very active in terms of cell division and cell growth. And the binding domain for uh, PSMA compound that we use is a misnomer. They are actually very small a molecule. It's PSMA agonist or PSMA antagonist. The PSMA antagonist basically bind uh, to the receptor and block the receptor. The agonist deactivate the receptor and get uh, internalized. So first the pharma industry and then the radio pharma industry got very interested uh, because they saw uh, the uh, potential uh, in terms of uh, patient's treatment even before they saw the potential for diagnosis. And the gentleman who has been the most active uh, is uh, Dr. Pomper from uh, John Hopkins. They have a zillion of patterns uh, on uh, some of the PSMA compound, but as I said early on, uh, basically there are a zillion of those uh, PSMA compound, and everybody's trying to get the, uh, the new blockbuster drug available and make billions of dollars, um, uh, definitely. Uh, an example of this uh, sensitivity rate of PSMA. Uh, if your PSA, uh, at least the new sensitive uh, uh, PSA detection, is more than uh, one nanogram per uh, cc per ml, basically the sensitivity is very high, 93%, uh, and it's more than two nanogram per cc, sensitivity is going to be uh, close to uh, 100%. So uh, in the United States, uh, I don't think the rule, uh, any rule has been made in Canada, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but uh, in the United States, so if you submit a claim uh, or if you get pre-authorization uh, to do uh, a PSMA study, be it gallium uh, PSMA or fluorine uh, 18 PSMA, and the patient has a PSA less than 0 0.5, it's likely going to be denied. Uh, and the reason is because sensitivity in that case is only 72 75%. And if it's lower than 0 0.2, uh, basically you probably should do the study. You should uh, recommend the study. Also, uh, <clears throat> uh, there are, uh, the PSMA story, uh, the, the Pilarify or Elusix or Locamets, that's a three commercial name in the United States, 
uh, a compound that teaching us basically a totally uh, uh, revisiting, if you wish, uh, the medical uh, medical sport textbook uh, in, in urology and, and prostate cancer. Uh, this is uh, actually a, an example I love to use. Uh, this is a bone scan of a patient. There is uh, an infiltration, uh, I'm sorry, there is an extravasation of the dose in the left AC area. Uh, at the level of the uh, right uh, collarbone, it could be a med, but it could be a inflammation of the joint. But look on the right side, uh, the, uh, the F18 PSMA study is showing basically metastases all over the skeleton, where the bone scan was negative, and the PSA of this patient was 150. Uh, so uh, the, the PSMA, a camp out, a diagnostic PSMA, in my opinion, is going to become basically the norm, is going to become uh, the standard of uh, diagnosis test uh, to localize uh, those metastases and evaluate uh, the tumor burden. Now, is PSMA 100% specific? The answer is, of course, no. This is a 75 years old um, uh, uh, gentleman. Uh, with prostate carcinoma diagnosed in 2021, GLISO 9, high probability of uh, metastases. But in 2020, he also had uh, a B cell and then lymphoma. And uh, his PSA was normal. Uh, and if you look uh, uh, on the left side, that's uh, uh, the FDG study showing uh, a few uptake at the level of the chest, and then you do a PSMA, uh, and there are metastases all over the place. Uh, we read it as basically a metastases uh, for prostate cancer, but also uh, that uh, patient B cell lymphoma uh, was again very uh, very active. So it's not 100% uh, sensitive and not 100% specific. This type of test basically doesn't. Uh, really exists. So when we interpret uh, a PSMA study, uh, we take into account patient history, but also we keep in mind that other type of cancer, colorectal carcinoma, they might take a PSMA. Remember what I said, PSMA receptor is a little bit more ubiquitous than just uh, overexpressed on the surface of prostate uh, cancer cell. Uh, this shows again sensitivity. Uh, we struggled with this patient in March uh, of uh, last year, actually, 2022. Uh, the PSA at the time uh, was three, so we should have a sensitivity of 97%. We didn't see much of anything, uh, and we do PETs. Uh, we do PET CT uh, with state of the art equipment. In May of 2022, uh, basically, PSA uh, was uh, also elevated. And uh, finally, in August and September of 2022, our PSA was uh, 6.8. And finally, we were able to see a small node picture on the hybrid images on the right, uh, a pre sequel node. So yes, the images in the article are easy. Uh, people usually show their best possible images. Not that easy to make diagnosis and uh, we can struggle at heart. And I'm wondering for a reason why um, a prostate cancer uh, tumor might not be uh, PSMA positive. And one of the reason is because uh, you have prostate cancer, which have what's called the neuroendocrine differentiation. Uh, basically, they don't really express PSMA receptor, and uh, they, they express actually the somatostatin receptor. Uh, so at times I recommend to do a dot and date study uh, but the oncologist would tell you, or the, um, the euro oncologist would tell you they have seen it. Uh, they have cases like that, probably three to five percent. Uh, this is a good example. Uh, the bone scan basically uh, did not show much, nor uh, did uh, the uh, PSMA study, even though the PSA was 100. Neuronocrine differentiation, negative uh, PSMA um, study. Uh, I'm not going to uh, go too much into that. This explains uh, basically the mechanism of neuroendocrine differentiation. It's quite similar to some extent uh, to the iodine refractory uh, thyroid um, uh, cancer. Limitation. As I said, loss of PSMA expression in advanced castration-resistant prostate carcinoma. 
uh, that's a flip-flop uh, mechanism, that's a metabolic switch, neuron fine uh, prostate cancer. Uh, and then you cannot really expect that uh, every single prostate cancer cell will express uh, the PSMA receptor. You always have, like in, uh, with every tumor, heterogeneity uh, in PSMA expression. And finally, if you don't really have a state-of-the-art scanner with a limited spatial resolution, limited sensitivity, uh, you might miss uh, uh, some, uh, some lesion. Uh, the result, very good article here in the New England Journal of Medicine. I encourage you uh, to take a, a look at that. There is no doubt that PSMA, uh, lutetium 177, PSMA uh, 617, that's one of the compounds, and then you have the 611 and a few others, uh, make a big difference uh, in terms of wiping out uh, those uh, lesions. And this shows an example where basically on the left side, the PSA of the patient 375, uh, bone metastases all over the place. Uh, you treat with four doses of mutation PSMA and you wipe out all the metastases. The problem though, and that's an evolving field, of course, the problem is that uh, you, you wiped out the metastases, but I've seen some cases, uh, we have treated some cases, we wiped out all the metastases and by the same token, we wiped out the bone marrow and you have to stop the treatment. Uh, so not easy. I think it's uh, an evolving and we learn every day with uh, uh, each patient that uh, we treat. Clinical research opportunity, Teralastic 2.0 and 3.0. Uh, you're familiar with uh, probably microsphere uh, treatment of some uh, cancer. Uh, maybe C-sphere or Terasphere, your interventional radiologist might, uh, might do that. It's basically rely on the selective injection of uh, microbeads labeled with uh, yttrium or uh, with microbeads uh, in, in, in some type of cancer. Uh, the, your, some interventional radiologists are familiar uh, with uh, what's uh, with this. Uh, with yttrium 90, uh, you can do quanti quantifications. It's used for all kinds of uh, uh, liver metastases. Uh, but urologists also can use it uh, to uh, target the prostates. Uh, and uh, you can inject selectively in the liver, you can inject uh, selectively uh, in, in the prostate. Uh, it's called um, a PACE, the a PA prostate, um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm blocking on the, uh, on the prostate artery embolization here. Um, the, the radiologist who have uh, access to cone beam, it's, um, I would say, state of the art CT scan would tell you that it's not that difficult to access a prostate artery. So some centers in Europe, uh, I'm not aware of any United States, I'm sure they do exist. Uh, and in, uh, if I started to inject uh, into the prostate artery, uh, lutetium-177 PSMA. And as you can expect, and it's uh, shown at the bottom right of the slide, uh, the concentration of PSMA, uh, lutetium PSMA is much higher at the level of the prostate. And ultimately that's what you want. You want a very high concentration uh, at the level of the site of the primary tumor. Uh, my friend at UCLA works in the VA, starting to use uh, basically the ACM-177 PSMA as a second line of therapy. Uh, what I see uh, are coming is basically selective theranostic injection directly into the different arteries. And it's true for prostate, it's probably gonna be true for neuronal tumor, and it's definitely also gonna be true uh, for um, uh, breast cancer. Then a burgeoning field, uh, I mentioned my friend, uh, John Pryor from Switzerland, deeply involved into um, immunotherapy and uh, immuno-oncology and immunotherapeutic. Uh, uh, the oncologists and the immuno-oncologists have uh, a wealth of knowledge uh, about basically uh, the environment of the tumor, which ultimately uh, block of favor, the spread of the tumor, uh, the growth of the tumor. And they can play, they can modulate uh, the environment of the tumor. And that's what's shown here 
uh, on these two uh, uh, these two graphic. And those of you interested, uh, basically, I can send uh, those article, those uh, reference uh, article. But the bottom line is that. Uh, what people are looking, and I'm looking at that uh, with the, the immuno-oncology, the immunotherapy group at Roswell, is to combine booze and nuclear diagnostic right now in a systemic manner uh, with basically those immunomodulator uh, of uh, those tumor. Hoping that uh, uh, using these two approach uh, will be able to get a better and larger success uh, rate uh, than by um, injecting systemically um, uh, the TCM 177 PSMA or, um, uh, or Dota 8 or the up upcoming uh, compounds. So the field of immunotherapeutic uh, is uh, uh, starting to uh, take uh, uh, its uh, uh, it's starting to, to to fly uh, in many center, many uh, cutting edge uh, uh, research center. Uh, across the world. So I expect that uh, probably in five to 10 years, uh, people will start talking to you about uh, immunotherapeutics. Uh, CAR T cell therapy, I'm not going to go too much into that, just to say that uh, you can reprogram uh, the T cell of a patient to express an antibody at the surface, which is going to target either prostate cancer, neuroendocrine tumor, and the most successful so far has been the reprogramming or the programming by transfecting those CAR T cells, the short sequence of DNA, the transfection uh, with the DNA sequence, expressing or triggering the expression of uh, a B cell lymphoma antibody, uh, re injecting it to the, those uh, uh, patients. Success rate is quite good, quite high, uh, but side effect can be uh, traumatic too. So those interested, again, I can uh, send you some article, I'll provide you uh, some, uh, some article. And then a very good article for those uh, of you interested, there are multiple ways to do, uh, label those CAR T cell therapy. So far has been indirect way, uh, but uh, I don't know if you remember uh, the acyclovir and ganciclovir business and then the late uh, Sanjay Gambi at UCLA, then Stanford promoted and made his career on and his success with NIH funding. Uh, basically, you can take pretty much uh, the reporter gene approach uh, and be quite successful. Again, it's a burgeoning uh, field. Expect to see this uh, in, in the next few years. This is a volunteer uh, receiving the CAR T cell, um, uh, the CAR -T -cell uh, label. Uh, with, uh, and I forgot, uh, actually was labeled with a compound called 18F uh, fluorinating uh, ARG, RIG, which is uh, some type of uh, uh, amino acid uh, derivative. And you see the distribution in the liver, the kidney, uh, and also uh, in, the, uh, in the pancreas. Uh, that's uh, actually showing in a patient uh, with high level at the level of the spleen, but it might be difficult to interpret, uh, but also uh, some lesion in the liver, metastasis in the liver, and some lymph node in the neck on the right side of, uh, uh, of the slide. Uh, that article, which is very good, and actually is in the uh, journal Theranostic, uh, highlights a little bit the different approach, the potential role for molecular imaging of those, uh, CAR -T, uh, the CAR T cell uh, therapy uh, business. Immunotherapeutic, if you look at, is a combination of immuno-oncology and therapeutic. And if you look at the prediction uh, of uh, uh, the, proportion, the proportion of surviving patients, it's projected that immunotherapeutic will largely take over targeted therapy. Uh, of uh, monoimmunotherapy, combined immunotherapy, and, and uh, what people call the personalized uh, immunotherapy. Uh, CAR T cell might be an example of, uh, of this. Educational channels and opportunity. I'm not going to go too much over it, just to let you know, and you know that uh, it's uh, an exploding field. Uh, medical school, uh, five, 10 years behind. Uh, in terms of uh, educating the medical students. So the role of the association of society, and uh, I mentioned about going to the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, we're gonna publish a report uh, in the Lancet 
on uh, oncology and diagnostic, uh, the status of uh, oncology uh, of uh, diagnostic across the world. They should be in this uh, month issue or next month issue of the Journal of uh, Nuclear Medicine, uh, an article on the education of physicians across the globe is very challenging uh, because of the lack of expert, the lack of center of excellence and so on. Uh, but I definitely, for those of you who are going to embark into that, you need to be educated. You need to have the experience and expertise. So you're probably going to have to spend some time uh, in some of the uh, center. Uh, that's a complexity uh, of the field. Uh, uh, which, touch, which touches so many domains, so many aspects uh, that it's difficult to master. So I cannot emphasize uh, enough uh, the need for a multidisciplinary uh, approach. If you don't get along with your pathologist, you're going to have a tough time. Artificial intelligence, great debate now in terms of uh, uh, the role of artificial intelligence. Uh, it's uh, a benefit, but also it's a uh, its problem and, and, and risk. Uh, in the United States, there was an article recently saying that artificial intelligence is going to be more deadly uh, than an AK-47 or an AR-15. We'll see what's going to happen. It has to be uh, related, but you need expert in artificial intelligence to read those can, look at those symmetry, and, and, and evaluate what I call the tumor burden uh, uh, index. And, and finally, complexity is from a medical imaging expert that we have become. We're going to turn, uh, we're going to need to turn ourselves into radio, uh, radionuclide therapy expert. And it's uh, very challenging. So multidisciplinary team, expert in the field, uh, for example, at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, they have 12 nuclear medicine physicians and two uh, of those physicians are fully dedicated, 100% uh, to uh, the councils uh, and, and the therapy. Not every center is uh, the University of Pennsylvania, uh, but definitely uh, you need experience and, uh, and expertise. This is uh, the journal I was mentioning. I mentioned TNO is actually thno.org. Uh, it's a free subscription. I strongly encourage you uh, to subscribe to it, but from time to time you take a look. There are a few good clinical articles and definitely research articles. I apologize, I'm about 12, 13 minutes late. Uh, I thought it was uh, very important uh, to give the member of the association and the others who have joined um, uh, tonight to give uh, a broad overview. Uh, call me if you have uh, any question or there are a few other experts in Canada and uh, uh, in, in the United States. And for those of you who are SNNMI member, I'd like to remind you that uh, there is a vote going on uh, for the v uh, vice president uh, elections. Uh, take a look at the candidates. Uh, the vote uh, is going to stop uh, on uh, May 25th, start of on April uh, 21st. Uh, so please cast, uh, cast your vote. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm sure uh, Andrew uh, will uh, uh, triage uh, those uh, uh, those of you, the, those, uh, uh, ch the chat box and uh, throw at me uh, those uh, questions that you might have. Thank you, Thanks. Thank you everybody. Thank you, uh, Jean-Luc. That was excellent, a very comprehensive overview. And as you say, we're a little bit long, but I think we'll uh, stay with it. There were a few questions that have popped in here, and I think probably those who asked them may want to hang around and maybe others as well to kind of uh, here the further uh, further dialogue. Um, Jean-Luc, the first uh, first uh, question from Rick Bro. Um, are there any guidelines as to how many patients are required before a Theranostics program for a given specific therapy should be set up? I'm sure there will be uh, enough prostate cancer patients for a center serving three quarters of a million or so, but what about some of the other Theranostic procedures including nets, et cetera? Yes, um, so it, everything is very arbitrary, right? Uh, so, but if you look uh, at uh, the website of the SNMMI, and if you download the applications uh, to become a center of excellence, either a clinical center or comprehensive center of excellence for radio pharmaceutical therapy, for some reason, good and bad, uh, the SNMMI has selected 
to try to avoid the, the work that Terranostic, they use radio pharmaceutical therapy. There's some criteria, uh, both for uh, neuroendocrine tumor, thyroid cancer, uh, prostate, uh, for radium-223, in order to be uh, recognized as a center of excellence. It's a very arbitrary number. Um, so yes, it does exist. Uh, I don't recall uh, exactly the number. It's actually not a, uh, not a huge uh, number. Regardless of the number, what's going to be very important, and I can help you out with that. I'm creating, actually, I created with for us uh, what's called uh, a therapy planning with order sets, uh, is to talk to your radio pharmacist uh, to your pharmacist and establish uh, in uh, your formulary, uh, basically, a treatment plan. Uh, and um, being consistent, having standardization uh, of uh, those treatment is the key uh, of success. Uh, and success means not only good patient outcome, but also avoiding uh, significant side effects. Thank you. Um, from Zan uh, do you think PET MRI and or PET CT will play a central role in the Theranostic approach by screening for appropriate patients and preventing potential futile costly treatments? Which modality uh, do you see is which which modality do you see is the potential standard of care in the next ten years for Theranostic market? So, uh, two ways to uh, to answer this uh, question. Uh, for example, the Mayo Clinic used PET MR for the management of all his prostate cancer. Uh, uh, at Roswell, we don't have one. I'm trying to have a core facility, PET MR facility in, in Buffalo, uh, but I fully agree. PET MR will be critical uh, for uh, the management, both diagnosis and therapeutic evaluation and outcome of patients with uh, not only prostate cancer, but also OBGYN cancer. Those of us who look days in and days out at the CT of the pelvis, particularly without CARFAS, know how difficult it is uh, to identify the different structure. So my prediction is that when the PET-MR uh, unit are becoming you know, less costly, right now, four to five million dollar room renovation, one to two million dollar, it's way too expensive when costs will come down. Uh, basically, I think many centers will probably embrace that to improve uh, the, the management, not only of prostate cancer and OBGYN cancer, but also uh, brain tumors, and uh, also most likely um, uh, breast cancers. So the answer is yes, very good question. Uh, please fully embrace that. The problem is that uh, short of winning the lottery, you're going to have to have big donors and big support for your from your organization. Oh, I think you are muted. So, uh, I, I cannot hear you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I just didn't want to hear, maybe interrupt you. So what is the strat from John LeBlanc in New Brunswick? So what is the strategy to establish a Theranostics program in our nuclear medicine departments where radio oncology and medical oncology seem to want to act as gatekeepers in some places. So, uh, John, uh, if you're willing to stay up to 1 a.m., I'd be happy to talk to you offline. Uh, my suggestion, give me a phone call and I can basically send you, uh, give you some ideas and eventually send you uh, uh, a template. Um, uh, from uh, another one of our uh, colleagues, do you have any experience with lutetium PSMA in glioblastoma? Uh, the answer is no, I do not. Uh, I, as I mentioned, PSMA is expressed in different type of tumor, in, including glioblastoma, which is usually uh, very aggressive. Uh, the principle would be this. Uh, if there is a take of glioblastoma with PSMA and you have all the authorization, it would be an off-label uh, use, basically, uh, by all means, uh, you can try it and you might, be some, you might have some success. I'm sure that uh, there are probably many centers. There's not many good compounds or compounds at all uh, for brain tumor and glioblastoma, so I'm sure that uh, many centers are looking at using those uh, that uh, mutation PSMA 
uh, to treat glioblastoma. Great, thank you, Jail. Uh, we've got a few more questions. I'm kind of taking liberty here with people's evening. If you've if you've had enough, uh, thanks for joining us. But there's just four more questions here, and I think everybody is has been very, very, very interested in this. So we'll just keep going with the questions for now because they are very. Um, they help expand on what we're saying. Uh, again, from Dr. Leblanc, as there is easier access to SPECT CT systems, what do you think of using technetium PSMA products for for the role in in, in theranostic? Uh, you know, the problem is that you're never going to have uh, the type of sensitivity uh, and spatial resolution with SPECT CT than you have with uh, uh, with SPECT CT. That being said, uh, I'd rather do technician PSMA than have no access. And actually, it's a very good question because uh, what we call the emerging world might have to resolve uh, to use uh, a spec CT compound. I know that uh, companies are, uh, are looking at it at six hours of life, so that might be beneficial. But uh, the standards uh, will remain uh, positron emitter. Uh, and then you, the center, the, the centers, and the radio pharmaceutical company will have to demonstrate that the sensitivity is close to. Uh, same story, uh, pretty much the analogy is uh, technetium or moly produced by cyclotron versus moly produced uh, by nuclear reactors. Just a couple more here. One, uh, so uh, question being uh, resources and software that we could potentially use for dissymmetry and in personalized treatment, um, and also kind of secondary to that is, do you think we need to actually have a physicist on site for this uh, for this kind of program? Uh, very, very good question. So. Um, my uh, problem with all the software probably uh, uh, that uh, MIM, uh, GE, uh, RMEs are willing to sell you, I don't even know the cost, I don't even want to know. Uh, basically, the problem that I have is like black box. Uh, so my analogy is uh, buying a black cat in a black box. So I was part of, uh, part of many committees at the SNMMI, and one of them is led by Pat Zanico, uh, who is the head physicist at Sloan Kettering, they have worked extensively uh, on dosimetry, and Pat has become a very good friend of mine, was telling me, Jean-Luc, you have to be a believer. I'm not a believer, I'm sorry, I'm not a believer, uh, and I'm not necessarily a believer uh, either of those software, but uh, short of a physicist, uh, you're going to need uh, this type of uh, software, uh, I can give you the address uh, in the email of Pat Zanzonico. I'd uh, be more than happy to help you with the SNMMI program. I don't know if they still take a center uh, to help out. But beyond dosimetry, dosimetry is only useful if you can really evaluate uh, what I call the tumor burden index. So let me give you um, a, a quick um, a analogy. Uh, when you use SUV, there are 25 parameters influencing the SUV. Uh, ultimately, what the oncologist wants to know is before treatment, you have uh, a 100% tumor burden index. What is it after first cycle, second cycle, third cycle, and fourth cycle? So dosimetry just part should only be a part of the tumor burden index. Uh, and the industry has difficult. You have to identify those lesions, apply the dosimetry, see how much deposit you have. And that's why uh, basically the health of radiation oncology and the partnership, they usually are very good to do targeted dosimetry. They're not necessarily uh, used to do um, uh, systemic dosimetry, uh, but uh, the physicists, uh, uh, can help you out at least to understand uh, the concepts. All right. Um, there's a, a couple of more questions. I, I think they're not necessarily germane to what, what we're talking about. One of them is uh, a list of potential sites doing theranostics in Canada. I think that's something that the CANM is undertaking to try and uh, and get a centralized database for that. Um, uh, so I, that would be the answer to that. So st stay tuned. That's a, a works in progress. And then another uh, question, sort of uh, not necessarily generic to the well, it's certainly related to this, but in terms of updates of uh, Pluvecto's provincial funding in Canada, 
I don't have one myself. I know that it's in progress. It's a slow progress. They finally got their, um, you know, got their Health Canada approval, and then it has to go to the, the various, um, the various uh, uh, funding uh, agencies. And I'm not quite sure where that is at this point in time, although we're following it uh, pretty closely. So I think that's probably something that the CANM can can kind of provide uh, conduit to the uh, to the industry that's actually going through that uh, process with the various uh, agencies that oversee that. It's certainly a convoluted and time consuming process, as we know, for for that. Um, I think I'm going to uh, close off at this point. Uh, we're closing in on 9:30, so an hour and a half. Uh, Dr. Urbana, it's always a pleasure uh, to have have you uh, lecture us. This is such a fantastic and dynamic field, and so exciting for nuclear medicine. Those of us who've been around for a while, uh, seeing it evolving, and and our new uh, our new grads and young colleagues coming in who are going to get to experience this fantastic uh, expansion of 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 this uh, of this field. Really a pleasure. Um, thank you. Um, thank you to the audience for staying tuned, for tuning in, taking time out of your day. I hope you got as much out of it as I did.